It's our mission to change lives, reach the next generation, and impact a culture. Are you ready for a joke? A man was taking it easy, lying on the grass and looking up at the clouds one day. And he was identifying the shapes when he decided, well, I'm just going to talk to God. God, how long is a million years to you? God answered, for me, it's about a minute. The man answered, well, God, how much is a million dollars? God answered, to me, it's a penny. The man then answered, God, can I have a penny? Then God said, in a minute. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the blessing that each and every one of us have in Jesus Christ. I thank you for each and every person that is here this morning and each and every person that is watching online. Father, I thank you that as we read your word and understand what you have to say about your kingdom, how to go wide, how we can understand and apply the daily principles that you have given us to have our lives changed and to walk in those things and have a complete mind transformation according to Romans 12. Father, I thank you that we are renewing our minds daily to be able to reach the people who need you the most. Father, I thank you for strengthening in us, for watching over us and keeping us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, I'm really excited. I got a crooked bottle of water, y'all. Kevin, I hope it doesn't fall on any of your equipment, but I'm going to try as best as I possibly can to keep it going. Well, we've been in a series, if this is, if this is your first time here at Revive Church, we've been in a series t- entitled Deep and wide. And the whole reason why we got into this series, actually we're walking through a book by Andy Stanley that is entitled Deep and Wide. And if you have not read the book, I would encourage you to read the book because it was a complete mind transformation for me because I know the direction that I wanted to go, but I needed a GPS to help me get there, y'all. Do you understand what I'm saying? I reached out to Kerry Newhoff, a leadership podcast that I listened to, and I said, hey, I'm looking for a book that I want to read that has the emphasis on not only going wide and reaching the world for Jesus Christ, but also has an emphasis on going deep so we can keep the people that are in this house and grow them to become greater disciples and have a greater relationship and greater faith in the kingdom of God. And so we, I asked them for that and they gave me this book called Deep and Wide. And so I read this book two or three times and it transformed the way I'm looking at different things in the church and how to structure and how to go deep with each and every person in this room so we can dive deeper into relationship with God. So we can stand up and say, if God be for me, who can be against me? And you can stand up like Elisha when he's surrounded by the enemy army where he said, there's more with us than they that be with them. It's the kind of people that stand up in the face of adversity and say, I got this. It's the people like David who stand up in the face of Goliath, an enemy that is 10 feet tall when you're just a teenager, but he had the faith of a giant where he can stand up and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defiles the army? of the living God. It's people like that that are deep in their faith. They know that I am more than a conqueror in Christ, but then also have an emphasis on going wide. The first week I talked to you and told you about what the church really is. What is it for? And we had a balancing scale that was up here talking about how churches, and I believe the reason why churches have declined in the last uh, decade or so is because the church, the church has become dead. And they become more focused on going deep with the frozen chosen rather than going wide and reaching the lost. And I believe the only reason why people don't go to church is because they've attended church. (laughs) Took a little bit to get that. Took a little bit. Because we're creating churches for church people. We're not creating a church. We're unchurched people or people who don't know Jesus or people who have seen church and have had a bad taste of church. We're just creating churches and multiplying churches like that. Nobody wants to go to those churches. There's no life in them. People don't even say hi. People just say, oh, I'm good. I've got Jesus, but I'm not going to share it with anybody else. I'm not going to be that church. I want to be a church that says, yes, thank you, Jesus. I got what I need. And I'm going to reach all my friends. And I don't know where that came from, but that's all I'm out. We're going to reach all our friends, y'all. That's what we need to do. And this balancing scale was talking about the church and setting up the church where we can see where we're having an emphasis over here on being able to disciple people and help people grow their faith, but then not forget the other side of the balance scale where we're doing things outreach, reaching the lost and being like Jesus to the least of these. That was the whole sermon, the whole first part of it. The second week we talked about last week was about going deep. And we talked about going deep and what does going deep really mean? How, how do you become a greater disciple and a greater follower of Jesus Christ? What does that look like? And, and I pointed out that it's not going to Bible school for two years, three years, or getting a doctorate in theology. It's not that. Because I can tell you this, and I'm not trying to brag at all. I aced every single test in Bible school, and I did not study for a single one. Do you want to know why? 
because I listened to it as I was growing up my whole life. My parents were good parents and they put me in the word of God and the exact same teaching of Andrew Womack and all. So I knew the word. What I didn't have was a relationship. I did, what I got from Karis Bible College from the two years that I went there was it established my relationship with God. Not my relationship with my parents who had a relationship with God, but my relationship. So whenever I stepped out of the nest, I could spread my wings and fly because I know my God's got me, right? That's what Bible school did to me. And when we talk about going deep, yes, we need to have biblical literacy. Can I get an amen for that? We need to know the word of God. But you don't need to know it from front to back. If you don't know what John 3.16 is, it is a-okay, y'all. It is okay. All right? My grandfather, he was amazing. He can quote Genesis to Revelation with his eyes closed and trying to paint a wall or one foot on a ladder upside down. I don't know. He could quote all of it. And he'd just ask him something and he's got it. I ain't there yet. But does that make me any less of a Christian and a less of a follower of Jesus Christ because I'm not where my grandfather was before he passed away? Absolutely not. What we talked about about going deep is a different outlook. It's not about how much you know. It's about how your relationship and how much you can trust your heavenly father. It's how much you can trust whenever you're about to jump in the pool. He's got his arms. He's going to catch you. It's about when you're about to do something very scary. Very scary, and you know that there's a cushion called your Heavenly Father, and He's got you, right? That is all about going deep, because we talked about those pivotal, the, the faith, five faith catalyst was practical teaching. We need to know the Word, but you don't need to know all the Word right now. We're all about taking next steps, and when we teach our regroup leaders, when we have our regroups every semester, we don't need to take a person who knows nothing and make them into Billy Graham in two months. All we want to do is get them to take one more step, one more step. One more step. And that next step is closer and closening them to their relationship with God. Then the private disciplines we talked about. We talked about personal ministry. We talked about providential relationships. I explained all about that in pivotal circumstances. You know, where we had the pivot foot. Where you've got an enemy that's ringing out pretty good right there. Where you've got an enemy right in front of you. And I explained the basketball term. Where you plant your pivot foot. And then all of a sudden somebody who's much faster than you. And better at basketball than you. Comes up to you and tries to face you. What are you going to do? Are you going to pivot and run away? Or are you going to pivot in advance? Try to do a little juke move. Get between the legs and then score the basket. What are you going to do? It's those pivotal circumstances. Whatever that enemy may be. It might be a bill because your car just broke down. And you ain't got the emergency fund like uh, Dave Ramsey talks about. It may be a relationship with someone just either hurt you or someone you love just passed away whatever it is there's pivotal circumstances in life that we have because in this world we will have tribulation but jesus said fear not i have overcome the world it's in that moment it's in that pivotal circumstance that's either going to make my faith and grow it or it's going to break me and i'm going to run away it's in those moments you know who are the true people who love jesus because they are holding on and not giving up amen it's the people when you feel like you're going into a situation, you feel like, you, I've had this happen way too many times where I've walked in and I thought I was going to be the one that had to pick them up. And by the end of it, I felt so encouraged by them. I'm like, you should pass to the church, not me. <laughs> because they're going through this hard thing. But yet in the end, they, I know, they know that they know that God has got this. Amen? Amen. Now today we're going to be talking about going wide. In the beginning, we talked about how to balance. Last week we talked about, two weeks ago, we talked about going deep. This week, we're going to be talking about going wide. And this is where the different stuff is going to come into place. And a lot of what I'm going to be teaching you is corporate things that we can change as a church, but also individual. So don't overlook this and see, oh, the church has got to do this. But guess what? You're part of the church, so you've got to do all this stuff too. And it helps us be able to go wide and reach other people. And it has to do with communication. It has to do with the environments that we have. And it has to do with all those different things. And the biggest thing I want to talk to you all about is don't allow this church to be the best kept secret in our town. Let's not allow this church to be the best kept secret and say, oh, we've got a good little club going on right now. We've got our, church, we got our, our chairs all filled up and we're, we're, we're doing well. Let's just stick right here. I know everybody. I'm having fun. Don't allow this church, this place to be the best kept secret in this town, y'all. We are called to go wide in Jesus' name and reach everybody that needs Jesus. And when we talk about going wide, we can see this situation in Acts 10. Have you guys ever read Acts 10? It's my favorite 
one of my favorite because Peter had a vision. He was at the top of the house and I, I think he fell asleep, but it says he had a vision. So whoever wants to write it can write whatever they want. But I think he fell asleep and, uh, when he was supposed to be praying. And uh, he sees a vision. And in this vision, he looks up at the heavens. And all of a sudden, a sheet descends down. And when that sheet comes down, on that sheet was every different type of animal. Every different type of animal. And according to Jewish customs, when Peter was seeing this vision, he couldn't eat certain meats. All right? So they had different dietary laws. And so in this vision, he sees all of these animals. And all the animals, a lot of them he could not eat. And a lot of those he did not touch. And one of those is, is, is pork. And y'all know the best part of pork is the bacon, y'all. We got to have some bacon. We got to have some good old bacon, y'all. So he, he, he looked at that and he says, my flesh is weak, but my spirit is strong. Or one of those things. And uh, so he looks at it and he says, Lord, I can't do this. I've never eaten any of these animals or any of this in my life. And my favorite part of the scripture was Jesus or God says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And so I take that every time I go into the deer woods. God, I'm arising and I need you to send me a deer so I can kill and eat, y'all. That's all I say. And so, and so he goes through this whole vision, and then Peter says it again. He says, God, I can't. I, I've never eaten those animals. I've never done that. I've never done anything like that against you. And God says, don't call unclean what I have called clean. Amen. And then, boom, right after that, he gets called by a couple servants to go to a Gentile's house. Y'all, if you don't know about the, 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 the issues that were going on back in the day, the Jews were it, y'all. They were the thing. They were like the joke the Joneses. They were the people of God, all right? So they had the word. They had all of that. And then when you go to a Gentile's house, you were unclean. It was like, going, no, 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 you don't go over there. It was like a step, four, eight steps down to go to a Gentile's house. And so he got summoned. And so he went into Cornelius' house, who was a Gentile. And then he went up to him and he preached the word of God to him. He loved on him and he gave him the gospel. Amen. That all of it sums up. It says, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you did. God still loves you. Amen. And there's a chance for you to be saved. Amen. Jesus died for you. And he loves you no matter what. Amen. And then all of a sudden, all of that Cornelius house gets saved. They get baptized in the Holy Ghost. But whenever Peter goes back to Jerusalem, everybody was just like, oh, you went into a Gentile's house. You were going and you went to lunch with this guy. You went to, I saw you with this person and he's a sinner. Can I get a witness that the church was transformed because they made a decision that God made for them. And they said, I am going to go wide rather than stick with the individuals and try to go deep with a certain few. But God wills that all should come to eternal life in Jesus because he said, I don't care if you're a Jew. I don't care if you're a Gentile. I don't care if you're a man. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're Hispanic. I don't care what you are. I want and I love you. Let's go wide together in Jesus name and so the church faced this whole thing where we got the frozen chosen we got the apostles there's 5,000 of us let's stick with the Jews yeah we've got a good group there's 5,000 but yet there's still thousands and thousands more of people yeah we may have 100 150 people in this church 200 people in this church but there's 3,000 people in this town that need Jesus God is not willing that any should perish but all can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ amen, amen. Matthew 28 and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go everybody say go, go. that's to you and to me he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Guys, we have the greatest story in all of history to proclaim. That God himself became a man like you and me to be able to reach us. He came like us. He did everything. He grew up like we grew up. Went through all the same temptations that we went through, yet without sin. He gave up the glory of heaven to eternally be put into a body of a man. And after three years of ministry where he got attacked, three years of ministry where he got spit on, three years of ministry where he got rebelled against and people walked away, after three years he's still in the garden, says, God, if it's your will let this cup pass but not my will yours be done I'm going to do this because I know who I am going to save each and every one of us in this room amen and so he did that it is the greatest story it is the greatest existence of love for a man to lay down his life for everyone Romans 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were running away from him, and while we were talking bad against him, and while we were doing things that were contrary to what he wanted you to do, he still loved you. Amen. 
every one of you. And so today what we're going to be talking about is how we can get this message across in our personal lives to reach people that need God the most. Because in this area in New England, I'm going to pose you something right here. I'm going to pose you a little bit of something because we, we all talk about people, they may not know God and they're starting with a clean slate. But in New England, it's a little bit different because we have a history, predominancy of religion. A history of you have to do this to get closer to God. A, a something that tells you you have to do something to get righteousness. It is a religion that is tearing people down. And they already have something written on their hearts about what church is. But it's up to us to break all of that down so we can break people off of, off of religion saying, I need to get to God and bring them into a relationship that says God already came to me. It is that is what we have to break in this area. So we're not just starting with clean slate with most people. We need to come down on their level and help them break down whatever they went through and the past circumstances and situations they got themselves in so we can bring Jesus right into their heart. Amen. That is what we need to do. And so here's a few things. And these are corporate things that I can talk about that he put in this book, Andy Stanley. One story was he got invited to go to a men's Bible study. And, uh, of course, he was a Christian, but he, they were inviting unchristian people. And this was at a church that he had never been bar, b to before. Went to a friend's Bible study at another church. And as he walked into the facility, they walked down this hallway. And there's a couple things that he mentioned as soon as he walked into the facility. Number one, it smelled. Number one, there was clutter everywhere. Number two, there was a llama in the corner eating the curtains. Number three, the uneven curtains were all over the place. And did he mention the smell? <laughs> and no, there was not a llama in the corner. He just added that in the book anyway. And so when he walked into this men's Bible study, yes, adults are here. Adults Bible study in here. There's, 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 there's stuff everywhere. It's so cluttered. It's not even, I mean, so many of us, never mind, let's just go on. And he said that the lessons that he learned from walking into this environment was number one, we aren't expecting guests. Amen. Can I get an amen? When you have family come over, you clean. But when you have guests come over, you deep clean. Yeah. <laughs> you deep clean. You sit down and you realize there's a cobweb in the corner. Why is there a dead rat under my couch? <laughs> Has anybody fixed the garbage disposal lately or whatever's going on? And so when you have guests come, you deep clean. And so this church wasn't expecting guests because they had clutter everywhere they weren't cleaning. Number two is we're not, okay, sorry. What we're doing here is not all that important. Look at this way. Look at the secular, just a little, the secular world just for a little bit. When you walk into a bank, are they not all put together? Walls are tidied up, perfect paint on the wall. There's nothing laying out everywhere and everything is in pristine condition. Do you want to know why they do that? Not, be not because that they got a lot of money. It's because they've got your money and they want more of it. So they make it look, they have the environment set up as we've got stuff put together so you can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me. And number three, it also says when you walk into a cluttered space, we expect someone else to clean up after us. Amen. That is the worst. I hate that. My wife hates it because I do it all the time. It's bad. I have a really bad problem. When we just leave stuff cluttered everywhere, you expect someone else to do it. But when you have the passive lifestyle where you expect someone else to do it, that's going to leak, leak into your spiritual lifestyle. Amen. Nobody else is going to study the word of God for you. You got to do it. Amen. No one's going to minister to your neighbor when God's called you to minister to that neighbor. You've been set here for such a time as this to go wide and reach people that don't know Jesus. Amen? Amen? And so number four, it says we don't take pride in our church. Now, I take pride in my church. I take pride in the teams that we have established in this church. I take pride in everything that we do at this church to be able to bring you guys an experience and bring you guys into a place where you feel comfortable, where you feel like you can invite your friends and they're not going to be weirded out because there's cobwebs in the corner. They're not going to be weirded out because someone's going to um, go crazy on you. We want to be a church where it's friendly and you can come in and invite people that don't know anything about Jesus. That's why our cleaning team, they preach a message before I even touch the stage. Our parking team, they preach preach a message before I even get up on stage. Our worship team is preaching a message before they get up on stage because they're here every single Tuesday night to sing right before they rehearse. They get ready so it's excellent in everything that they do. What we do, we take pride in and that's what we do to bring the word of God to you because our God is a God not of disorder. Can I get an amen? It's of order. And there was a second story and this goes into our children's ministry. He walked in and uh, to another church and he had one 
I think a 10-month-old boy at the time. And he walked into this church. And they, go, they went to this church because that church had a re- reputation of having a really good children's ministry. And so he walked into the church and there was no signage. He had no idea how to get to the children's ministry. And he's walking in, finally finds somebody. He points him to an open door. And he walks into this open door and there's one other guy on the other side of the door. And he's got a 10-month-old child. And then so all of a sudden, they're like, um, are we where we're supposed to be? Is this the kid's room? And he said, yes. So he gives him his child, and he realizes the door open in the back, and he kind of feels a little awkward. And Nancy, there's no other kids in the room. It's just him and this other guy with his kid. So he goes to the auditorium, sits in the worship service about five minutes in. He turns to his wife and says, do you feel funny about this? She says, yeah. She ran back, and everything was fine. There were tons of other kids in by the time. But he said that experience, that environment that they said in the beginning, he said it taught him four things. And no, he never went back to this church. Number one is we don't expect new families because there was no sign-in paperwork and they, because they have the same kids every week. Amen. There was no security for the kids. There was no nothing. Number two is that if there's an emergency, we don't plan to notify you because they had no paperwork. Whenever your kids get all crazy like kids always do, we've got numbers that go up on the screen. And 90% of the time, it's probably my kids anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> and number three, your child's security is not our primary concern. Again, we're going wide. And the reason why I'm teaching you, number four, our volunteers don't understand how parents think and how they're untrained. Now, the reason why I'm telling you is to make this point. Time in erodes awareness of. The more time you spend in a certain place erodes the awareness of what that environment looks like. The more time you spend in the word of God, and don't don't get me wrong here, we've got to spend some time in the word of God. It erodes the awareness of the person that I'm going to try to reach doesn't know anything that I just read this morning. Doesn't know anything that I just read in the last three years. Doesn't know anything. And so our time in and any situation erodes the awareness of somebody coming in new. They're going to find all the quirks. They're going to find all the problems. They're going to find those cobwebs in your bathroom that you've not noticed for the last six months. They're going to notice that. And so we need to understand that our environment matters. And that's why I'm preaching this to the whole church. Not because I want you to understand what we're doing, but I'm telling you, you can be a part of it. You just like last week, I don't know where Tom DeMatties is. Where are you at? Tom DeMatties, he's over here. He took our jump start track last week and he was telling me how we had all the, a whole bunch of new people last week and he was saying that he just went up to them and was welcoming them and said, I haven't seen you before. How you doing? And just welcomed them. Tom was not ushering or greeting that day. But he chose that he was going to say, hey, that person's new. I'm going to go welcome them because I know what it's like to walk into somewhere new. I know what it's like to be how awkward it is to walk into a party if I'm not invited. I'm going to go in and make them feel right at home. And that's what all of us have a job in doing. Our time in this church awards the awareness of. So I want to make us all aware when a new person walks in the door, let's make them feel welcome. Amen. 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 And then we can go on to irresistible. And we need to understand that when we make a, a church irresistible, it's not about just being relevant, how we dress or how we have the, the music or play a video in the beginning. It's not about being relevant. It's about being irresistible. It's about making it so that people want to come back. It's not about having people, maybe they can pencil in going into a life group, but that's the first thing on their time budget that they can put in. I want to make it and go to a life group. Because I'm telling you guys, our groups are transforming people's lives. This last Friday, if you got some, you, you should sound them up for the youth group. We went, can I get an amen? Savannah, Logan, Riley. We went to Sky Zone and my inner kid came out. I had so much fun. It was a great time. And so we want to make it irresistible because we had multiple, multiple, multiple of the youth that didn't miss a single one out of the eight sessions that we had with the youth. That didn't miss a single one. And they wanted to be there. And the ones that couldn't make it to certain ones because of other responsibilities, they were so wanting to skip and go. And even one, I think it was Logan, he was talking about how he already had plans. We were supposed to go to Sky Zone a week ago. And he already had plans for this last Friday. And because of the Nor'easter, we canceled last Friday, we scheduled for this Friday. He canceled his other plans that he had planned in a month in advance just so he could come with us to Sky Zone. That's how groups are changing lives. It's making them irresistible. And then we talk about excellence. That's the next one. We're going to talk about excellence in everything that we do. And there's three things. There's three keys. And this is where I want to sit for a little while. There's three keys to making a service and you excellent. Number one is the setting appealing and comfortable. Is the setting appealing and comfortable. Like I told you before, we clean for family, but we scrub for guests. Because I don't care what you do. We're setting up environments in everything that we do. 
Everywhere we go, there's an environment. When you walk into Panera Bread, there's an environment. It's a certain kind of environment. When you walk into a Costco's, there's an environment. And I want everybody in this room that to be aware of the environment so when somebody walks in and doesn't know what they're doing, we can make them feel welcome and show them that this setting is appealing by picking up after somebody else and we're helping them make them feel comfortable. I want the parking team to have their own environment where they're waving at people, they're bringing out umbrellas. Y'all, if you haven't come on a rainy day, you should come. We got some cute orange umbrellas that we bring out to you. It's really fun. And so that's the number one thing is the setting appealing and, com- and comfortable. And that goes all the way down to our regroups. And I should challenge every one of us. Sit down in your living room and look around. You may like what you see. You may not like what you see. L- look at the different areas, all of the flat spots that may get dust on them. Just pay attention. You might help, I might help you here keep your house a little bit cleaner because when you have regroups, when you set that up and you want to lead a regroup, people are going to be looking. Amen. I'm just saying. I do it all the time. I'm just helping you. I'm a real pastor, all right? People are going to be looking. And so if you want to lead a regroup, just, just look around your house for a minute. And if your house isn't, you don't like it at your house, have it at the church. We have a fun time here at the same time. And so is the setting appealing and comfortable? We have the opportunity to make it appealing by helping cleaning and doing and making it comfortable by blessing people with our presence. And number two, this is where I'm going to camp out for a little bit. This one's big. Is the presentation engaging? Is the presentation engaging? Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you this. Engaging means to capture one's attention. And so many pastors are trying to teach people to pay attention rather than capturing their attention. Now, I don't move and tell stories into this thing to teach you something. I try to capture your attention so that way you don't want to look at your phone in the middle of service. You're listening to me, y'all. I have an art. I can do it. I can make people watch me. I can make them. I can engage. Because when you walk down the street, it's a little bit different. Can Can I get an amen? And I'll walk up to you, Phyllis, right now. It's like really weird. Because everybody's watching and talking to you. And everybody on live stream is watching you as well. Because the camera always follows me. And I can make it really different. And this is a different environment now. Because I came on your level. But is the presentation engaging? Now let me tell you this. Mm. Hmm. When you go into a restaurant, is there a reason why you pick a specific restaurant out of the hundreds of restaurants that you can go to? They all serve chicken, beef, or pork. (laughs) Or fish. But the way that they present it is different. Can I get an amen? There's multiple churches in this community. There's multiple churches in America. But how are we presenting the gospel, the greatest message of all. See, I fear that so many people have thought, and even millennials, even my age group, have seen church as irrelevant and boring and is not understood, and you, and you can't apply it because people are teaching messages for something that is not appealing to them. And they're not engaging people to say that I can apply the word of God into my situation now. This is not just a book that was written 2,000 years ago that I just got to read and believe. It is a book that I can read now. And the same words that were written 2,000 years ago, I can apply it to my life right now. Yeah, I may be 16 years old and I may have tried on the king's armor. But yet I am a shepherd who is about to be the savior of Israel. And my name is David. And I didn't need to wait for 20 years. I am ready now. And that's the message for all teenagers. That's the message for all adults. Moses was 80 when he started his calling. Abraham was 100 when he had his promised child. I don't care where you are in life. God can use you where you're at. And it is the people in the Bible. It is the message of the Bible that gives us hope today to step out and do what God has called us to do, y'all. We can take the word of God and apply it into every area of our life. Can I get an amen? That's what Jesus did. Because Jesus didn't just come up and teach people. This is the word of God. Repent. That's not the only thing he did. 90% of the time, he used parables. A parable was simply a physical um, representation of a spiritual truth. Can I get an amen? Amen. On Luke 15, he taught about the lost sheep. It says if a shepherd has 100 sheep and yet loses one, does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go find the one? Physical meaning so he could relate to shepherds. 
about the truth of God, meaning that even if God has 100 people that love him and care for him and one walks away, he's going to leave the 99 and go find that one. Maybe you are that one right now. Maybe your child is that one. And you know what? You know what's really cool about that? There's an inner message to that. Because when you've got 100 people in a room, or 100 sheep, let's just take sheep. Let's just keep it in contact. How do you know what's the difference? How do you tell this sheep is Bob, this sheep is Billy? How do you do that? They don't have physical features that are different, whatever. They're, they all look like sheep. It explains that there's a system applied that one is missing. Amen. He knew that one was missing, meaning he cares about all 100, not just the 50 good ones and the fi- all 100. So when that one went missing, I'm going to chase after it and I'm going to find it. Amen. In Matthew 13, we can see the, the, the parable of the valuable pearl and the hidden treasure. Where it talks about a person who sees a pearl and it's of great value. He goes and sells all he has. This is a merchant and buys that pearl. He was using that analogy to speak to business people. In Matthew 13 as well, we can see the parable of the sower. And he was speaking to farmers. Amen. Luke 12, we can see the faithful servant. And back in the day, they had servants. And it spoke to servants. We can see all throughout the scriptures where Jesus used parables, not to confuse people, but to relate with people, to come down on their level. And he didn't just say, y'all, you're all a bunch of sinners and you need me. He said that the kingdom of God is like a, is like a sheep who runs away from the sheepfold, but yet the shepherd cares and loves about his sheep so much that he leaves the 99 that are in the open field to go find that one. Or when he sells all he has to purchase the pearl. Can I get an amen that God bankrupt heaven to buy you and me. And that was his church. He sold everything he had to gain a relationship with you and with me. Because when you don't own something, you're not able to use it. And when you don't own something, you don't have possession of it. But God sold everything that he had, even the cost of his own son, to sell and bankrupt heaven to be able to buy you and me. I can guarantee that on the cross, Jesus didn't say, forgive them, the people that were in front of him. He was saying, God, I want everybody to forgive him. Because God is not willing that any should perish but to all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ amen Amen. his presentation was engaging y'all he had thousands of people attend he was like the the Billy Graham of the day y'all he was it of course we teach of Jesus Billy Graham taught of Jesus you know he was all that and a bag of chips (laughs) but we need to understand when it comes to a presentation that is engaging we need to focus on the presentation A couple months ago, I had received a package that I've been waiting for from Amazon. And when it arrived on my back porch because it was two weeks late, I had found out that the box that the the item was actually in was a box that was half box on this end, half box on this end, stuffed together with my item inside, no packaging on the inside, taped together all like this. And it came bent, laying up against my door. I was super excited. I was all, I was, I was just giddy. And it was an item that could easily have been bent. And the thing was two weeks late and it was a mess. When I opened it up, I was about, I had Amazon on speed dial, y'all, I was ready. And I opened it up, but the package, the product inside was just fine. But the presentation was damaged. We have the greatest message all of eternity could ever give. And how people look at it is how you present it. There's nothing wrong with the item inside. How does everything to do with how we present it? Because we need to remember, there's another thing when it comes to presentation, and there's something that you can actually hurt. It's called the curse of knowledge. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Who all understands when I say the curse of knowledge? Just a few of us. I'm going to explain it a little bit. All right, everybody, close your eyes for me really quick. And I'm not going to throw something at you. I'm just going to make an analogy. Close your eyes really quick. Let me make the analogy here. I once was lost. But now I'm found. I once was blind when I didn't know Jesus. But now when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, now I can see. Right now, just imagine you as being someone who doesn't know Jesus. And I come up to you being the only one in this room that can see. And everybody on live stream, close your eyes. Don't peek. I'm watching you. Or God's watching you even greater. Everybody have their eyes closed. And I'm going to describe something to you. I'm going to describe something to you. Now, the first ingredient, I'm making something here for you, for you to have. 
I'm going to first take a goober. And then I'm going to mix it together, grind it all up with the secretion of the plant and the basis of that that got it all put together. And then after that, I'm going to mix in a little bit of sodium and chlorine. I'm going to mix it all together, and that's my first ingredient. Then over here in this pot, I've got the seed of a Theobrahma cocoya. Then I'm going to take that, I'm going to dry it up, and I'm going to grind it really good. And I'm going to add in all of the great things you know. You all understand what I'm talking about, right? You should have said no. It's okay. Your eyes are closed. I got you. But what I all just described to you, I probably did a horrible job, and I took it from another pastor because that's just what I do. Can you all guess what I just described? Go ahead and open your eyes. Who all knows what I was just talking about? This is peanut butter cup. <laughs> Thank you. It's my favorite too. They are really good frozen as well. <laughs> See, what I did was I just, I just taught you and showed you and tried to describe something at its core. We got the cocoa bean, which when you dry it, grind it all up and separate the cocoa butter, it makes cocoa powder, which is the basis of chocolate. Then I had to basically explain a peanut. It's actually, I looked it up on Goober, Goober. I looked it up on YouTube, or Wikipedia, and another name for a peanut was, uh, was a ground nut or a goober, so I used goober, okay? And so the goober was the peanut, yeah? And we mixed it with honey, which was the secretion of a plant that was mixed together with God's creatures. And then I mixed it together with salt, which is sodium and chloride. And that's exactly what you get together when you put peanut butter and chocolate together, and it's a Reese's Pieces. But I tried to explain it to you from the basis of it, rather than just saying, hey, Chuck, just kidding, not Chuck, you knew what I was talking about, give it to you and say, hey, just taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. I don't need to explain to Sue how good God is. I just got to tell her that when I was lost, then God got me found. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I didn't need to say, oh, you guys know what I'm talking about. We don't need to go into great lengths to explain the kingdom of God. Basically, all you can say is taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't need to explain the peanut butter and chocolate. All i got to do is give it to you and you can taste it for yourself. You, when people discover the word of God, then it opens their eyes to greater things. I can teach you all day and what I say, all of you are going to take it differently. But when God reveals himself to you, like I read in Psalm 34, that you can taste and see that the Lord is good. You don't know how to hear about how good it is. I want you to have a personal example of how God is good to you. Can I tell you how God is good to me? If it wasn't for God protecting my younger brother, he would be dead right now. If it wasn't for God protecting me, I would be dead right now. If it wasn't for God protecting my family, we would still be living in Minnesota and no revived church would have been planted here in Vermont. I've tasted and seen. Look at my wife. I have tasted and seen. The Lord is good and he has blessed me. Amen. I don't need somebody to tell me how good God has been to them. I just need to know that God is good to me. And my first example to you is God saved me, a wretched sinner, who when he was 15 years old did the dumbest thing a 15-year-old could do, stole my parents' van, drove it with a permit, but you know what? God used that, and now I can see 12 years later and seeing that the Lord was good because he used that to put me where I am today. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And when you go up to preach someone, to minister the gospel to them, you don't have to use eloquent speech. You don't have to use long prayers. God doesn't like long prayers. They're good. I love them. I do them all the time. But you don't have to. Just go up to them and say, Jesus loves you. And I don't care what you've done. You are going to be a blessed individual because of Jesus. Yeah. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You see what happens the curse of knowledge is we try to talk about so many things about the word of God where what we're doing is talking over their head so they do not understand what they're saying. Amen. You're taking your huge dump truck worth of knowledge and dumping it on them and you're overwhelming them which is going to make them run away. Amen. See what you know is a level 10 but you need to bring it down to a level 2. Time in erodes awareness of. You need to be like Jesus and spend some time with some tax collectors and sinners to understand how they operate so you can speak into their lives. Amen. You need to. And I'm not saying they have to be your, your number one friend because sometimes they'll bring you back where they are. Amen. But you need to spend time with them. You need to help them. 
but don't allow your curse of knowledge in the kingdom to be ineffective with reaching people who need Jesus the most. And third and final is this, is the content helpful? Amen. Is what you're telling them helpful? If someone's about to, to if someone just got diagnosed with cancer, they don't need to know about the second coming of Jesus Christ. <laughs> they didn't need to know about eschatology. They just need someone to love on them and pray for them and see them healed. Amen. They need someone to walk with them. Is what you're doing helpful to them? Is what you're doing helpful to them? And there's three things in this I want to give you. Um, in the, is the content helpful? Is number one, help them think biblically. Now, when we had Jim and Darlene Hetzel here last week, what I love about their missionary journeys is they don't go to these countries to feed people. They go to equip them to feed themselves. Amen. They don't go and give a hand out. They go and give them a hand up so they can start handing out to others. Amen. And they multiply doing that. And according, I want to bring people into the kingdom by helping them think biblically. Not to just tell them what to do, but to help them renew their minds so they can think it and do it. Because in Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so if we can get you thinking and understanding that you are the righteousness of God. And there's nothing that you can do to gain righteousness. And there's nothing that you can do to have righteousness go away from you. But you are. God created you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. If we can get you thinking that way, guess what number two will happen? Your behavioral will become biblical. If you start thinking biblical, then your behavior will become biblical. So many times religion will get that shifted. Saying that if you behave biblical, then you'll think biblical and that is totally wrong because what you do on the outside totally stems from what's on the inside so if you flip that back up get your stinking thinking right then your behavior will be right after that so help people think biblically help people behave biblically and number three help people contextualize biblical teaching help people contextualize biblical teaching now, if you have not read the scriptures, we can read all throughout the Bible where one part says that Judas went and hanged himself, and then another part says, go and do that likewise. That's not good, right? Amen. So we need to contextualize. Those are two different scriptures for two different parts, and when you read the word of God, we have to help people understand there's a context to it. There's a context to it. And so I'm super excited about that, and I want to have, go ahead, and you can just start playing your thing, do your thing. I want everybody to stand up, because I got one more thing that I want to say. I have one more thing that I want to say about the context being helpful. Now, I want this to sink in. And the worship team, you can... You know what? We're going to close right here. That's what we're going to do. We're going to close right here. Because this thing, I want us to be the last thing that we hear. Because I want this just to sink in. Is the context helpful? Here's a little quote that I heard, again, from Kerry Newhoff. Knowledge alone makes Christians haughty, but application makes them holy. Knowledge alone makes Christians haughty, but application makes them holy. Jesus said, and I believe Matthew 5, that he said, a wise man will hear the words of mine and do them. Faith accompanies action. So you may know a lot, but God wants you to walk in a lot. Yeah, we may know that God wills for me to be healed, but are we willing to believe it for ourselves? We all may know that Jesus died on the cross for every person's sins, but me. right now I want to give you a time to apply the faith that we have deposited today now I've said this many times today that Jesus Christ died on the cross for every one of our sins and it was that moment and that moment alone that he only could have came and died on the cross to wipe us clean and give us a clean slate and to completely wash our sins away and it's only that that gives you the ability to become the righteousness of God and enter into a relationship with God. It is only through Jesus. And so I believe, again, Romans 9, 10, it says this, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. 
And so I want all of us to say a prayer where we're confessing Jesus as our Lord. And I want all of us to believe that in our heart if you're ready to. Because I want to see all of us saved and enter a relationship with God. And so in honor of the individuals that are doing this for the first time, I would ask the church to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I've tried it my way, but it's been wrong, and it hasn't worked. I'm ready to give it all to you, my King, my Lord, my Savior. I have been doing wrong, but now I'm giving that to Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to this world and He died on the cross for my sins, my pain, my anxieties, and my sicknesses. I believe that Jesus Christ is the way to heaven and He is the Son of God. I thank you now for saving me washing me whole and making me righteous in Jesus name amen every eye closed and every head bowed I want just to be between you and God if you just prayed that for the first time would you just show your hand and the ushers are going to get a get a card into your hand and get a DVD into your hand every eye closed every head up every hand up that uh, just prayed that for the first time thank you Thank you. Praise God. The kingdom of heaven rejoices for the two individuals that just gave their life to Jesus, y'all. Praise God. Hallelujah.